Good morning. So today I'm going to talk to you about music and intelligence and the idea that listening to classical music, particularly that composed by Mozart, can make you smarter. And let's face it, who isn't looking to be a little smarter, gain that mental edge? The fact that many of us are looking is evidenced by the huge number of products that are marketed to us to improve brain function. This ranges from very basic things like crosswords or Sudoku puzzles, getting out the old pen or pencil to get your brain sharp, or you can splash out and invest in one of the new brain trainers. These are things like uh, brain training, brain age, things you can do in a few minutes a day. And if Patrick Stewart thinks it's good enough for him, well, who am I to argue? Now, some people prefer a more natural approach. So they might select particular foods that have been touted to have brain-enhancing properties, maybe blueberries for memory or foods high in omega-3 or DHA. Some people even go a little bit further and look at their drugstore and the wide range of supplements that are sold to us to improve memory, focus, concentration. You can go even further than that. Some people experiment with stimulant medications to try and get that extra edge. We're in the middle of finals week here at Western, and I know students are trying everywhere, everything they can, to get that last little bit of information into the brain so that they can perform better on their exams. And who's to say that we should keep you know, a monopoly on these products for humans? You can even buy products for your dog. This was one that uh, promotes healthy brain activity in dogs. So this is a multi-billion dollar industry that is marketed to us to help us improve our mental function. And there's even more money to be made if your product or activity is something that helps children. Children are engaging in school is a major activity, and this is something that lays the foundation for the rest of their lives, their career choices. What parent wouldn't want to give something to their child that would give them that extra edge and help them perform better? Now, the thing we're also looking for in this whole range of products is something that's effortless. We don't really want to work for our mental edge. That's not fun. We want things like popping a pill or changing our diet. And if there is work involved, we want it to not feel like work. So we'll do brain training as long as it feels like a game or doesn't require too much time every day. And music fits very well into this category. I can pop in a CD or turn on my MP3 player, and then I don't even have to change any of my other daily activities. I can carry on doing what I'm doing. Same with children. They can be doing whatever it is they want to be doing, playing on the floor. You can just turn that music up to try and get their brain enhanced. And there are many products that are sold for exactly this purpose. So for adults, you can buy Bach for the brain or Mozart for your mind. There are many products aimed at children, um, so their parents will buy them and play them to their children. There are even products, you can see a couple here, the Mozart effect for moms and moms-to-be. And there's a contraption in the middle that allows a woman to place speakers directly on the abdomen so that she can get that music or whatever she's playing right into the womb without having to go through the airwaves. So these make some pretty impressive claims, these products. For example, you can stimulate bonding, communication and learning before birth, invigorate brain growth and development in the womb. What pregnant mother doesn't want their baby's brain to develop the best way possible? And you can positively affect emotional perceptions and attitudes from pre-birth onward. Now, do these products have any evidence for them? Well, one tells us that it is based on up-to-date medical and psychological research in creativity and intelligence. The pieces on each recording have been carefully chosen to provide a rich listening and learning experience for children of all ages. So what is the research that backs up these claims? Most of these claims and most of this research can be tracked to a single line of research that was spawned by one study conducted in 1993, which gave us a term from the media called the Mozart effect. Now, in this study, the researchers wanted to find out if listening to music composed by Mozart might actually produce better processing of spatial things, so that people would do better on tests of spatial function after listening to Mozart. So in order to test this, they played undergraduate students, so not children or babies, but students, 10 minutes of a piece by Mozart, or they had them listen to a relaxation tape for 10 minutes, or they just sat in silence for 10 minutes. And I'm going to play the Mozart piece for you now so you can see what it's like. And I'd just like you to think about what words you might use to describe this Mozart piece and how it makes you feel. And keep that in mind for later.
So after their Mozart or relaxation or silence, the students completed a few different tests designed to assess their spatial function. One of these tests that comes up again later is the paper folding and cutting test. You can have a go here yourself if you're feeling particularly bright this morning in your spatial skills. This test involves um, imagining what a piece of paper that's folded several times and had some ma spatial manipulations made to it, and then some cuts made into it, will look like when you unfold it. The dotted lines show what will uh, fold. So in this particular example, a piece of paper is folded over once along the midline, then folded over again, folded over again, folded in half, mirror reversed, rotated 180 degrees, then have little snips made out of it. Is anybody feeling particularly bright this morning and have a guess? It's pretty intimidating. So who thinks it might be A? B? C? D? E? We've got a whole range. Those of you who said B can turn smugly to your neighbors and feel good about yourself for the rest of the day. That's the correct answer. But as you can see, this is a very difficult spatial test. So how did our students do? It turned out those that had listened to the Mozart did better than those that had just simply listened to a relaxation tape or sat in silence. And the media jumped all over this study. In fact, the lead researcher had a phone call from journalists before she even knew the paper had been published. Hundreds of articles were published touting music for the mind, Mozart for the brain, Mozart makes you smarter. But the problem is this study actually raises a lot of questions. We, we don't know a lot about what's causing the effect. So is it the fact that the musical genius of Mozart is being communicated through his music, stimulating parts of our brain involved in spatial processing and improving performance? Or is it just something about music more generally and nothing to do with Mozart at all? Or is it actually the fact that the music had no effect whatsoever, but sitting and listening to a relaxation tape, or sitting in complete silence on your own with nothing to do for 10 minutes, a little bit boring, and so the control conditions actually made performance worse. So it's not that the music is beneficial, it's that the other two conditions are actually somehow harmful to spatial performance. So there are a lot of questions raised by this. In addition, it was not conducted in children, it was conducted in adults. So we don't know how all these products that are marketed for children could draw their conclusions on the basis of this study. So the next study tried to tease some of this apart. In this case, they tested children, four and five-year-old toddlers, and they gave them that same Mozart music, or they gave them a different piece of classical music. This was composed by uh, Albinoni, and it's called Adagio, and I'll just play it for you now. So quite a different feel from the Mozart piece that we heard earlier. And then the other conditions that they chose involved children's music. They had the children either, either listen or sing along with familiar children's music that they had learned in nursery. Now that paper folding and cutting task isn't really something you could administer very easily to four and five year olds. So instead of doing that, they had the children draw pictures. And then what they had were adults who didn't know what music the children had been listening to rate these pictures. And they rated them on creativity, on energy, and on technical proficiency. And what they found is in the two lightest bars, the familiar children's song, either listening or singing, produced by far and away the best performance. So it turns out that the music these children knew and loved blew Mozart out of the water. And you can also tell when you compare the Mozart and the Albinoni performance, so the Mozart's in black, lower than the familiar songs, and the Albinoni's in the sort of light gray next to the black, that there's a difference. Even though these are both classical pieces, um, conducted by very well-respected composers. One of them, the Mozart, has better performance than the other. So this tells us a few things. One is that maybe it's about music you enjoy, and the second is if it's music that you don't know or you're not so familiar with, maybe it's about something in the music itself that changes your mood or your energy somehow. The Mozart's very upbeat and up-tempo and happy. The Adagio's very slow and contemplative. It's a piece often played at funerals. So in the next study, they wanted to assess whether it was about the way the music was making you feel. It's clearly not about Mozart or complex music, because children's music tends to be very simple and repetitive and have easy-to-learn melodies. So it must be something about the response that these people had to this music. So they conducted another study where they used the Mozart piece and the Albinoni piece, but then they asked people how they felt about that piece. 
What did it do for their mood and their arousal or energy levels? How much did they enjoy it? And what they found was that the improvement in the paper folding and cutting task was very highly related to the arousal and mood that the music had induced in these participants. So here we've got the Mozart group doing better on the, in the white bar, that's the paper folding and cutting, Albinoni doing a bit worse. But we also see that their ratings of arousal, mood, and enjoyment are higher for the Mozart and lower for the Albinoni. So it's nothing to do with the classical music per se. The effects were actually all driven by how the music made these people feel. Now this suggests that maybe it doesn't even have to be music. If it's something that just makes you feel good and improves your mood, improves your arousal, and something you enjoy, there are a lot of things like that that aren't music. So this study actually compared the uh, performance on the paper folding and cutting after listening to Mozart or after listening to an engaging Stephen King story. So no musical component at all. And then they asked people which they had preferred. Had they enjoyed the Mozart more or had they enjoyed the Stephen King story more? And they divided performance up that way. What they did this, you can see the performance of the people who preferred the story on the left. Well, if you preferred the story, you did better after listening to the story. If you preferred the Mozart, you did better after listening to the Mozart. So it was nothing to do with music at all. It was how you enjoyed the experience. If you did something you enjoyed, you did better on a cognitive test. So this suggests that music does not have special cognitive enhancing functions. However, by changing our mood and our arousal levels, it can improve performance on tests. And this is no small thing. For example, many older people are concerned that difficulty in finding words means that their memory is going and that maybe this is the onset of something like dementia. So they'll go to a memory clinic to have their memory formally tested. And every time they go to these clinics, in addition to getting memory tests, they will also be given mood inventories to screen for mood disorders such as depression. And that's because someone who is depressed can perform as badly as someone who is having the onset of dementia on these tests. Even though their cognitive function is actually perfectly intact and they're not dementing, if you have problems with your mood and your energy levels, your cognitive performance really suffers. Now, none of these studies tell us about the response of babies or even fetuses to music. So should I, as a pregnant mom, be investing in some of these products that allow me to deliver music directly to the womb before my baby is born? Well, it turns out if I'm doing it to enhance that baby's brain growth or function, um, no. There is no study that finds that music listening for babies or fetuses has any effect on brain function or cognitive ability. None whatsoever. Now, this isn't to say that music doesn't affect babies. The same way music affects our mood and energy levels, it can affect babies as well. Many parents will tell you that music is something that can soothe their babies very effectively. However, it's not something that's going to enhance their brain function. So I've talked a little bit about music and intelligence and music and mood and arousal, and I'd just like to finish by talking about some of the things that music can do for us through its effects on our mood and arousal. It is a very powerful force in our daily lives, and just because it doesn't enhance our cognitive function through some mysterious way doesn't mean it doesn't have important uses that have been scientifically supported. So, for example, music can reduce pain. It can reduce pain after surgery, during labor, or even chronic continuous pain. Music can also aid recovery from stroke. So if rehabilitation activities are centered around music, they become more engaging, and patients can engage in them longer and with greater focus and enjoyment. This makes them much more effective. It can also pr uh, improve endurance and perceived exertion, or how hard you feel like you're working, during exercise. And I don't know about you, but for me, anything that makes exercise feel a little less painful is a good thing. Music can also help walking in Parkinson's disease. There's something about the regular rhythms and the steady beat that can make their movement more rapid when they have trouble with slowness, or help them begin movements when they have trouble with initiation. Music has also been used in these patients effectively as a reward. When they're walking in a good way, the way that we want to reinforce, they get to hear music that they like, and this encourages them to walk in a better fashion. And finally, music can have interesting effects on dementia patients. If you play music from a patient's childhood, they often can recall memories from throughout their lives. In fact, there are some amazing examples of this. This is a picture of Henry, you can see online, who's a patient uh, in a nursing home. 
and much of the time he spends very withdrawn and non-communicative. If you give him his music though, music from his childhood that he knew and grew up with, he comes alive. He's able to communicate and talk really animatedly about his love of music and about the music and the effect it has on him. So music may not be the shortcut to producing brainiacs or mini Einsteins, but it does have powerful effects on our minds and our bodies. And scientists like myself are always excited to carry on investigating music so that we can find other ways to tap into its potential. Thank you. <laughs>